one Paul to another. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. Paul. What a great name. <laughs> very much of a generation, though, and you seem to be a little bit young for a Paul. Yeah, I know. I I think my I think my mother was going to call me Sam, and I was like, right. okay, sounds like a serial killer. So now, when I was um, many years ago, I worked at uh, University College Dublin, and I played water polo there, and there were oh, four wow. Pauls in the team. Wow. And it was, you know, I can usually, I can usually gauge somebody's age if I meet another Paul. They're usually around about. I, I, I blame McCartney myself. <laughs> I think that that was where the Pauls all came from. Just as all the Carolines were named after Princess Caroline of Monaco. My mother's name's Caroline. So geez. there you are. You see, there, it's, uh, you know, and I've got a Beatles top on, so you know, maybe well, there you maybe. are. There he is. That's the he's the respo- He's the the, the the guy who's responsible for it all. I think. And that... isn't it? And you know, his real name is actually James. No. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I think they Fair just enough. call. I think I think Paul might be his middle name, but isn't it? Really, his birth name was James. Yeah. I know. Jimmy Jimmy McCartney. That would have been very different. <laughs> <wouldn't it? laughs> yeah. It was written in the stars. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm very good. I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Thanks for you, thanks very much for doing this. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. So the last time we spoke, obviously you were it. You were you were in France. Were you actually in France during? Like, what part of France were you in during the riots? Uh, I was in the. Um, I was down in the southwest. I was um, most of my family, although they didn't, they're not from the southwest of France. I was in an area called the Cohes, oh, which okay. was which is the uh, the departmental. The department's called the Cohes. The capital is Toul. But probably a slightly better known city is Brive. It's about an hour south of Limoges. Oh, okay. So it's kind of where you and I would think of the southwest of France okay. starting. It's the beginning of of Cassoulet country, as they say. So, wow. you know, if we're going to kind of do, uh, if we're going to regionalize France through its cuisine, then that's uh, it's kind of duck and goose eating. That's okay. The, uh, that's okay. the kind of the setup. I might miss that. <laughs> oh well, okay. It's not everybody's. Uh, <laughs> not I, was everybody's. In, I was in Paris once, and uh, they got they gave me like a snail soup, and I was like, "Oh, bro, what is um, this?" Well, just... yeah, that's very much an acquired taste. I wouldn't. Oh my uh... god, definitely, definitely acquired. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyways, back to the the situation. Okay. Um, how did France? get to that point because I'm, I'm sure it's it's some it's a multifaceted thing obviously the uh, the the situation just didn't happen because of that one incident i think that obviously there's a spark of something like that france colonized algeria so a lot of the the people that would have rioted would be kind of algerian descent so how did that kind of get to that point okay well there are lots of as you would expect there are lots of different layers to mm. what happened in uh, late June, early July, there are lots of lots of factors playing into it, and also one of the one of the things that a lot of commentators, myself included, when we were invited to talk to the media, were the, one of the points was to go back to when these things had happened before, because it's not the first time that the French, the bonlieu, I'm going to use that expression, the bonlieu. That's the idea of the. It gets translated as suburbs, but it's more the kind of uh, the idea of the heavily built up kind of skyscraper type areas that you see in a lot of, uh, well, certain French movies, those kind of slightly underprivileged, not slightly, but in some cases, very underprivileged areas, which tend to become uh, ghettoized, which are kind of on the on the edges. That's why the French call them the, the bolieu, but they're on the edges of France's big and not so big cities, actually. That that's one of the, the factors. So it's not the first time it's happened. That's the mm. first thing. And there have been a whole series of these. It was very. I mean, the last time that it really went up big time was two thousand and five. Now, to me, it felt like you know, at my age, that feels like no time at all. But actually, a lot of people made the point that when the last time this kind of happened, uh, the poor victim Nael wasn't even born, you know, so there's a kind of generation between the two. That's not to say that we thought that the problems of 2005 had gone away because we knew they hadn't. Hmm. But there have been these kind of sequences of events, moments of violence in France's banlieue, which are to do with um, 
to some extent with social deprivation, although, you know, one of the points that was made this time and even last time is that the French state throws a lot of resources, perhaps not very intelligently, but tries to throw, uh, to put money into these, these areas. Very often they're defined as priority zones for, for inward investment. Um, but there are, there are all kinds of other factors playing uh, in the background. Um, so that's one of the things. But there is also this idea, I mean, the, the, the kind of the, if you want, if you want the, the sparking point, the, the, the shooting of Nael is very much to do with, or certainly is connected in the minds of those, of, of the people who, you know, the rioters, is the idea of racial profiling. That here you have a young lad who is visibly not white French. In inverted commas, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be very guarded with my terms here. I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm driving at here. But there's certainly the idea that because he's third, fourth generation, um, I think uh, the description I've seen is uh, Algerian Moroccan, uh, um, a mixed mixed parentage, but not, if you like, ethnically ethnically French, but French by by definition of place of birth and and passport and so forth, but it's 17 years old. But the idea that he is re that he's representative of a group in French society that are always targeted by the police. Right. You know, and that's that's not unusual. We get it in, you know, if you talk to uh Black Britons, for example, they'll tell you that, and we know statistically that they are more likely to be stopped and uh stopped by the British police and asked for, for ID. Um, so this is, you know, so it's a factor pretty much everywhere. But in France, it's the it's it's very specific to um in this instance North African identity, but also actually um uh black African French identity as well. There is there are the people, the young people rioting, mostly young men, but also uh young women the young men who are writing a third or fourth generation uh but they are um they're from ethnic minorities so that might be north african so tunisia uh, morocco but of course principally algeria but also um uh west african because to do you, you know you use the word post-colonial and it's to do with the colonial connections with Countries like Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, Gabon, um, you know, uh, sorry, I'll translate for, for, for your listeners, Ivory Coast, um, you know, these kinds of places. So um, that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. And that they live in areas that have been either deliberately or, or uh, accidentally ghettoized. And, you know, maybe we'll come on to that in a, uh, in a moment, but certainly the idea that they are specifically targeted by the French police, that they are systematically uh, racially profiled. So that's that's part of the the reason why the whole thing explodes, that we've had all of these years of this kind of stuff. And then we get this, this particular, it's not the only case, there have been a number of mm. cases of, uh, of people being, men and women, being um, shot and dying uh, as a consequence of, of police violence. And it kind of becomes, you know, some would see it as being the the drop, you know, the, the uh, sorry, the, the hair that breaks the uh, the camel's back or the, the, the reason I said the drop is that in French, it's the drop that, that, that makes the bars overflow. You know, this is the point at which we've had enough. But I think it's also, specifically in the case of Nael, of course, the police say one thing happened but we've got film of something else happening mm. so that's what you know but underneath that's the kind of the the spark but underneath all of that are lots of different lots of different factors and you are specifically about the the idea of the you know the the the, the point about north african origin and again this goes back to and uh, France, uh, France being the, the colonizing power in uh, the Maghreb, that's to say in Western North Africa. I mentioned Tunisia, I mentioned Morocco. They were protectorates, but Algeria was actually part of France. And it's, it's really to do with the failure to come to terms with, on both sides, the French and the Algerian side, to come to terms with the end of the Algerian war. 
Mm-hmm. When was and that? Like 62? Was that 62? 1962. I mean, yeah. you know, it's crazy. It, it was. It finished before I was born. Yeah. So that tells you how how long yeah. ago that is. I'm 60. So <laughs> um, you know, it's a it's a long time ago. Yeah. But one of the what has always struck me, um, you know, as somebody teaching French culture is the way that, it, particularly that cultural representation of the Algerian War. That if you compare it with something like the way the America that American culture tries to cope with, you know, successfully or unsuccessfully with the end of the Vietnam War. And you get all of those films and you get all this kind of introspection mm. about it and what the hell we'll be doing. And, you know, there are there are films that's all kinds of different things. And culture. in France, you don't get that or you kind of begin to get it, but it's only slowly dribbling out. Right. And and so the the legacy of that conflict is still festering and that's not to say that you know the french feel that they're still at war but there is still a a mistrust and amongst many uh ethnically white french people there's still this sense of um uh uh, antagonism towards algerians and that becomes a kind of you know north africa becomes the kind of it's not just there is a kind of i mean these things are always uh detestable but there is a kind of if you like a hierarchy of racism right and i i would say that most well no not most french people french people who are racist would see the people that they dislike the most as being algerians and i've got a, a first year french student it's very interesting talking to her um she's actually uh, sorry first year student she's british her fact that her family of algerian uh origin her family in fact decided to come and live in britain and she says that she feels this very much when she goes to visit other members of her family who are in France hmm. that you know should be talking with people and everything's going fine and then they say oh where are you from and they say well I'm British but originally my family are Algerian and that are, immediately there's a there's a kind of a step back that's not to say that everybody in France hates Algerians but but there is this kind of sense that there's a there's a differentiation going on is that is that to do with say like cultural things because uh, from uh, looking at it from the outside, it seems like people that are, we'd say, third generation, uh, uh, you know, Algerians in France, they don't really identify as being French. So that the French might see that as quite a kind of like, well, you're in, they see it as you're in our country, so you kind of should adapt to our culture. Is is it a cultural thing or is it more than that? I, I think, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's more complicated than that. I think many, um, third or fourth generation uh well french nationals who are of algerian origin because they you know they're they're, we're talking about we're talking about very often um parents who originally arrived in france you know great their grandparents or even great grandparents who arrived Mm -hmm. in france in even the you know 60s and 70s and possibly even before that many of them feel french up to the moment where something about them prevents them from you know advancing into so most of them are perfectly uh perfectly comfortably assimilated perfectly french you know there have okay. been moments in french history you know the, the 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 victory of the world cup in 1998 was kind of seen by symbolically by people in france as being a victory i don't know if you've come across this slogan but it was the the slogan that was taken up was the uh, they took the the idea of the bleu blanc rouge uh, the french when they talk about their flag being red, white, and blue, they actually put the blue first. So it goes, so you get the alliteration, bleu, blanc, rouge. And they took that and it became uh, black, blanc, beurre. Black, white, and beurre is a slang term for French people of Arab origin. Oh, okay. And it was the idea that here you had, you know, the French football team in 1998 represented le melting pot, as the French would say, you know, the melting pot. The, the, and and it, was a, it was a symbol of success. Hmm. That this okay france is is not officially multicultural and that's another aspect of the of of the problem but um nevertheless here you had this kind of republican idea republican in the french sense that everybody is equal you have the colorblind state okay possibly or possibly not but and here you had this uh this football team made of a zidane whose family, North African origin, mm. you had a Turan, but you also had, so 
West African one. You had a Thierry Henry, but Henry was largely in the, on, on the periphery of the team. But you get the point. You have Vieiras, but you're Emmanuel Petit. And in fact, it became, it's very interesting, it was actually kind of staged. It's much more explicit in France. Anyway, the point being that you had this, this multi-ethnic France, but identifying as being French, playing for France, winning the World Cup for France. And that was seen as being symbolic, uh, you know, symbolic success. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't really follow, it doesn't really follow through. It doesn't, that, that's, it, it's, it's not, okay, so great, we can win a World Cup in football, but that doesn't mean, mean we're delivering real equality, right? real integration out in the banlieue or out in rural France or, you know, so that's the, the kind of sense that, yes, these things happen. And we're very happy when they happen. We're very happy when, um, you know, uh, a black French runner wins something or, you know, Thierry Henry or blah, 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 all of this happens. But nevertheless, it's not, that doesn't actually mean that what we have is a happily uh, integrated uh, national society. Right. I get you. And I think that that's the, that that's part of that sense of so that and I think I think that you know that let's let's not overstate it as well you know the riots that happened were it, this year were striking in their violence and yeah. in sort of the response yeah um, but they are about a minority of rioters within those and and the vast majority of young people in the banlieue are not going out and rioting there is but there is a real there is a hardcore that actually, you know, doesn't have a problem with this kind of level of violence. It's what we're going to go out and do. And, right. it, and it feels provoked. It feels a sense of frustration. And it's a bit like, uh, was it 2012 when we had the uh, the inner city riots in Britain under, under David Cameron? Similar kind of a uh, kind of sense of violence by the state. So we're going to respond to that uh with with um with violence as well and that's you know that's we and of course that also so it's partly being fed by the things i've just discussed but of course it's also being fed by recent examples if we think about france and the gilets jaunes movement of 2018 2019 um essentially that's that's essentially a white riot actually in, in ethnic terms you know it's it's about a white low middle class that's feeling uh dispossessed feeling forgotten by the state um but it's very violent and right. so the scenes of violence that we have this kind of continuum of violence by the state against various groups of people is continued so what do we do if if there's violence or if we're being you know we, we but we provoke violence and and so it goes. And so there's this kind of, this is what we're going to do. And every time now, and even with the pensions reform in France, every time that there's any kind of demonstration against anything in France now, the, the question is always, at the moment, it seems to, to me anyway, just how violent will this get? What will the what will the escalation be at the end? And we know also that you might have heard of of, of talk about uh, anarchist groups like the Black Blocs who um, apparently get involved in these uh, in these things, and they kind of send. If there's going to be a demonstration, we'll send our extremists to uh, to make sure that there's a bit of a, a fireworks show at the end. Yeah, uh, and, you know, turn over a few guns, and so that kind of. But it's part of a very violent. Um, response to a perceived violence by the state and that's that happens at all kinds of levels i mean the idea of you know young kids turning over cars and setting fire to them is is nothing new that once upon a time in france new year's eve there used to be in france it's called saint sylvestre because it, that's that's the saint's day um new year's day there would be a kind of uh, a kind of um score they, they would report the scores and how many cars have been burned in in certain cities in wow. france it was well, and again, this goes back a long way to the 1960s. You know, I was uh, I was talking with my students about this, and they said, "Well, you know, this all of this violence of destroying property and setting fires to car, uh, setting fire to cars, and all that doesn't that date back to May '68?" And I said, "Well, it goes back further than that. You know, in 1963, um, Johnny Hallyday 
the idol of the young in back in the 1960s staged a free concert in the uh i think it was place de la nation in the the east of paris but it's still quite a respectable area of paris mm -hmm. and after the the concert finishes um there's a there's a there there are uh, there's a demo you know, the, the the police are kind of just you know shepherding people towards metro stations and it kicks off and it ends up and you end up with cars being destroyed and so forth and people are sort of sort of scratching their heads and wonder if, wondering what's going on about it. so of course it's it's all to do you know we think of a lot of people of perhaps not quite my generation but older think that the 60s were wonderful it was a wonderful period of time but yeah it was very violent yeah um and and this kind of violence is not new and in France, it's certainly not new and part of it. And this is where it does come back. There's kind of a connection with the Algerian war is that violence on the part of young people in the 1960s towards the police is linked to um, events of the 17th of November 1961, when, and again, I don't know if you know this story, but there are anywhere up to this protest by mm. Algerians living in France at the time, living and working in France at the time, a protest against the war in Algeria and French atrocities uh, being carried out in Algeria. And there's a demonstration at the Pont Neuf in Paris. And what happens at the Pont Neuf is that the police turn up and they decide to start chucking protesters in the river. Wow. And anywhere between the, the estimates vary enormously. I mean, the, the, there's never been an official. Um, uh, no official statistics, but various, various um, reputable sources put the figure anywhere between 50 and 300 dead. By being thrown in the river? Well, either thrown in the river or having the living daylights knocked out of them and dying as a consequence oh. of their injuries. So, you know, anywhere between that. So that establishes that mm. establishes a notion of violence by the state. This was under the... Uh, uh, the prefect of police at the time is a man called Maurice Papon, who um, had also been uh, uh, active under the, the Vichy, under Vichy France. But they, there was this extreme violence. Justice has never been done. Okay, the 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 perpetrators of that violence. One of the reasons we don't know how many victims there were is because there was no inquiry at the time. The people responsible for it were uh, were never uh, brought to justice, mm -hmm. and so that kind of that creates a folk memory, you know, and those folk memories are really important. It's a bit like the black and tans at croak, you know, it's those kind of the, these, it doesn't, these things don't go away. And in the 1960s, it creates an immediate atmosphere of a sense amongst young people who identify themselves to a certain extent with Algerians in France, with what's going on in the Algerian War of Independence, even though the, that comes to an end in 62, they identify the police with a violent state. And so that the idea of violence as a way of expressing your uh, your protest carries on in May 68. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of I mean, it's not a it's not a grow a growing curve. You know, these things go up and down. It's uh, it's a roller coaster when you look at the curve. But there are moments in the French recent past where it explodes and it particularly though not exclusively explodes in certain areas in certain banlieue of France it doesn't surprise me at all that it was Nanterre areas well it does it does to some extent because Nanterre there is a certain amount of affluence there um it explodes there because that's where that's where he was joyriding that's what he was doing you know the, I mean, the basic cause is so insane it's absolutely crazy uh, and everybody, of course, in France is asking, what's he doing? He's 17 years old. He doesn't have a driving license. Fourth time he's been stopped by the police. You know, this is crazy. But that's what sets it off. And you can never quite tell, of course, in these things, what's going to be the spark. But we know that, they, you know, with all of these things, there are long term causes. There's a moment in there's also the moment, kind of the general atmosphere. And then you get your your. Uh, your spark that that sets the whole thing sets the whole thing off, and I would say the the sort of the long term thing is the is the continuing sense of alienation from the republic, a republic that for some people doesn't deliver on its promise of you know equality for all, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't deliver on its its policy, its claim to integration, um, that 
in a shorter term has become uh, volatile and violent, the political authority, the authority of the police is massively undermined by things like the Gilets Jaunes protests, like the uh, the, the protests that follow pension uh, uh, strikes and demonstrations against pension reform. So that political authority, but also the authority of the police, authority of parents, authority of teachers in schools, all of that, you know, the notion of authority is completely, completely, but very much uh, debased for some people. And I, I think that's really important. You know, it's not every kid in every banlieue in France is is disaffected, but there is a sense of dis a sense of disaffection. Do you think that it's? I know it's. Uh, you could say it's a French problem. But it's also a failing of Europe because when people come into to Europe, we'll say, for example, seeking asylum, they're always put into areas, poor areas. So it kind of ghettoizes places. Then, like, like for example, we actually have most asylum seekers coming into Ireland are actually Algerian. Like Georgian, Niger, Nigerian, and Algerian, we've a lot of that. But most people that are coming in, they're not put into rich areas or affluent yeah. areas yeah. in Dublin. They're always put into yeah. poorer areas, which kind of then ghettoizes those areas, yeah. and you're not kind of integrating as a whole. If you get me, yes, I, I, I mean, I think that's true. I think, I think I would say one thing before I answer that question directly. One thing that's very that, that was pointed out is that although many of the the protesters, many of the rioters who were arrested, mm. a massive number of, of, of arrests were carried out, are actually second or third generation. They're not technically immigrants, okay? They're French, and there's a yeah. big argument. The big... That's the first thing. But the second thing to say is, yes, ghettoization has happened because, I mean, basically you're describing exactly, exactly the situation, that there is a tendency amongst the providers of social housing for uh, migrant populations to put them into the cheaper accommodation because they don't get much or, or, you know, in, in order to to at least make some money out of the state that's where they put them so it's less salubrious housing a tendency to create com community thing one of the things the the ideas the french hate is the idea of the community the idea that we would put all algerians in one place and all the people from Niger or from Ivory Coast in, you know, particular areas, but it happens not consciously, but accidentally, but, you know, nevertheless, there is this idea that we will put everybody from Yemen here, everybody's from Somali, uh, Somaliland over here. And so it goes. So yes, I mean, that's exactly what, what happens despite the best intentions of the authorities in mm -hmm. front so that you you do get that but actually these populations i mean the, the in france they are much more mobile right than is often uh you know that there might be a ghettoization on arrival but actually they are they're busting to get out you know they don't want to be stuck here they don't want to be okay there's a natural kind of tendency to oh these people are from where i come from so there's a natural tendency to group towards them but also a massive outflow so in you know uh, areas uh, to the north of paris the department of saint saint denis is an area of of yes uh arrival but also uh leaving again these, these are much more much more fluid people who've who've traveled are are willing to, to move on again they're not you know they're, they're not necessarily fixed but but i think that the there is necess there is necessarily get there is all the same ghettoization however hard the various authorities and organizations whether it's the state or whether actually it's you know voluntary associations or local government to a hand or a combination of all of those things mm -hmm. however hard they might try to prevent that happening it, it still happens but there is a fluidity to it do you do you think obviously i'd say more riots will actually happen throughout throughout france in the coming years it's not going to be just this isn't like one and done or whatever and done but do you think for example france like a lot of europe is moving towards the right because i seen when it happened le pen kind of came out and kind of seized her opportunity and i think it seemed like a lot more people were actually behind her if you know what i mean than maybe in in the past i know she was neck on neck with macron 
but Macron seems to be I don't he's, he seems to uh do a lot of stuff that ruffles the feathers of a lot of French people. I think I think again there 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 are a number of factors. One of the one of the things about so social media, I mean it's always existed, of course, but there's a one of the things that allow what the social media allows is is Macron bashing. And before that it was Hollande, but what the, the French use this term, Macron bashing, Hollande bashing. <laughs> right. Before that it was Sarkozy bashing, you know. Anything that's wrong is obviously the fault of the president. Well, you know, that's that that goes with the territory. Um the problem for Macron, a number of problems for Macron, um is convincing the French that he's actually taking these problems seriously. I mean in 2018 he commissioned um a former minister, a man called Jean-Louis Borloo, who had been in a city's minister, mm -hmm. a minister for the banlieue, minister for for for, the, for French cities, um, back in the early 2000s, he commissioned a, a plan. He said to him, look, I want you to tell me what the problems are. There weren't any, there weren't any problems, there hadn't been any riots. But Macron said, you know, I've been elected president. I want, I'm going to be here for at least five years and hopefully 10. I want a plan uh, and I want you to tell me what needs to be done in the bon Bonneau. And so Bono came along and he presented his plan several hundred pages long. Uh, no, a couple of hundred pages long, and Macron put it in the bin. And why and was that? Didn't do anything about it. Well, I think he just thought it, it was Bono was saying, "Well, these are the things you need to do." And the problem with Macron is that he, the only person he really listens to is himself. <laughs> um, he is he, to, is uh, he like a narcissist? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure he's a narcissist, but he's a classic French technocrat. Okay. And French technocrats are very much, you know, the idea is I already know the answer. So he is, but one of the, one of the big criticisms that's leveled at him and has been since the very beginning is his inability to, to dialogue with what the French call the, les corps intermédiaires, inter, intermediary bodies. So for example, he's, um, uh, in France, local government is really important. And local government is represented in France um, by the Senate. The French Senate is elected by, uh, indirectly by the people, but directly French senators are elected by, let's imagine, you know, if you if you would have a, uh, I know you've got a Senate in Ireland, but in Ireland, if you had a Senate uh, on the French model, it would be elected on the basis of the county. You would have senators who are elected by local councillors for, you know, Limerick, a limerick based on its population would have a certain number of, of of seats in the senate and so it goes and that gives local government in the french system it gives local government despite this idea of a very strong central state it gives local government a big voice right which macron ignores and he's ignored all the way down the line when the gilet jaune crisis was on local councillors said we know what the problems are here for heaven's sake talk to us and Macron comes along and says, I know what the problems are, and this is what we're going to do. And he launches this big sort of national debate, which is a discussion between him and the French people, and then nothing comes of that. We knew, you know, this is, that's how he operates. Hmm. So he commissions this plan and then ignores it and kind of says, you don't, you know, it's, it, there's actually supposed to be a conversation that he has with Bordeaux. Bordeaux comes along with his plan and says, this is what we need to do. And he says, I'll tell you what. It's not up to two white men sitting in the Elysee Palace to decide what's best for France's banlieue. Uh, but I says, well, why, why bother then? Uh, and nothing happens. So that's yeah. the that's the first thing that there isn't really Macron hasn't really thought. He, well, he has done some thinking, but he's tried to do it at a micro level. He's tried to do it particularly in the city of Marseille. Okay, he's really focused on the problems of Marseille and hoped that what he does in Marseille and what he's seen to be doing in Marseille will kind of be uh, seen by people in the banlieue and they'll say, oh, yeah, this guy is really, um, you know, he's really, he really cares about us. He's really trying to, to do something about the banlieue. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing was you asked about the drift to the right. Yes, undoubtedly. I mean, a lot of commentators, you said that, you know, Le Pen comes out and says these things. And actually, one of the, what was really striking about the riots was that she said her relatively little because she didn't need to. Mm. Because every, every, um, balaclava wearing youth who throws a bottle you know uh, at somebody or who chucks a molotov cocktail uh, at a school is another who know, who knows how many votes for her 
Right. And there's, um, you know, it's just absolutely playing into her, um, playing to her, her, her opinions. And there's increasingly amongst my, I mean, I don't know if they'll vote for her in 2027, but amongst my, my family, my in-laws in France and friends in France, even people of, uh, you know, educated people either saying, She'll, she's going to be elected or even saying what's the worst that can happen mm. you know in a, in the sense of and these are left-wing people who are and actually I had a very interesting conversation with two school teachers well it was just after the the whole this was actually no, this was back in april uh before the the thing had gone up but again this conversation about what's you know what are we going to do about it what can we do about it if she's going to be elected you know perhaps that's what we need perhaps we need a shock I, Personally, I prefer to avoid that. But um, so in a sense, she doesn't, she almost doesn't have to say anything. And actually, she's a very canny move on her part, Paul, that she, um, not very long after the election last autumn, she resigned as president of the party. Okay. Um, not because she was challenged, uh, but she wants to cultivate her role as being a sensible, serious politician so she's running the you know, there are 89 of her deputies in the in the national assembly and in her place the party elected basically her protege a young a young man young lad young lad to me but he's in his late 20s a chap called jordan Bardella, and he's the guy and there are various other people in the party they go out and make the you know they they basically are the kind of people who make the speeches about well look you know look at these these young people of uh, just look at their ethnic origins in compact you know they can't be french you know these kinds of this the kind of discourse of the far right she doesn't say that because she doesn't have to she lets other people do it for her right, right. and so there's a kind of there is that but that it, there is that rightward drift and there's that sense of you know a kind of trumpism going on that people are saying well they're, they're saying things we're all thinking we're all mm -hmm. thinking it aren't we well no we're not but you know that's so that's kind of feeding feeding her the traditional right in france has disappeared i mean the les républicains uh, are actually trying to play on her turf well they'll lose that game because she's the one you know she does it much better than than they do so and of course the other thing that's happening in french politics is that you kind of get the on the left you've got jean-luc mélenchon and his uh his part of the left not all of the french left mm -hmm. but his part of the left kind of playing to the um playing to the bon Dieu, saying the state hates you stay saying to i mean in it's back in june of last year when there was a similar uh incident to what happened to Nahel, uh jean-luc mélenchon coming coming out with a statement uh the police kill that right. too. so they're kind of stoking far left the, almost the the yeah the, this kind of hard left yeah you're right you're right the police are picking on you uh yeah you're right the state does hate you because in 2017 jean-luc mélenchon realized you know he was only 600,000 votes short of getting through to the second round of the election in 2017 mm -hmm. and he realized that those those votes would were, were were just not being cast out in the milieu so if I can get them to vote for me, then maybe I can get through to the second round. It didn't happen, but there's been this kind of cultivation of of certain groups uh, out in the in the bonnier by, uh, and so there's a kind of discourse on the hard left. As I say, not all of the left. Been quite a, a quite a dif difference of opinion within the left wing uh, alliance over um, over the riots. But Mélenchon is stoking that up on the one side. Well, you can imagine that for for moderates sitting in the middle of that, what, what are we what are we supposed to think? Do we agree with Mélenchon? Some of what he says, actually, you know, yeah, okay, we there is a problem with with post colonial France with decolonization. We do accept that actually, the police do seem to statistically pick on young men of certain ethnic backgrounds. There is racial profiling, but they then go out and burn down a school what well, you know moderate sitting in the middle of that and and what's macron doing well macron of course his response to that is the 
is the again what the French call the the muscular response to kind of tough you know to be to take the tough response and to to back the police. Except he doesn't back the police, of course, who are responsible for the event. Uh, he describes it as being unexcusable and uh, inexplicable. Mm -hmm. That actually really annoys the police. I mean, one of the problems that Macron has, and successions of French governments have had, is they've lost control of the police. Right. There are two, in particular, uh, two uh, French police unions. What I say, two in particular. One in particular called the Alliance, which is very clear, very hardline. Um, it would claim to be politically neutral. It's very obviously close to the far right. And my own view is that there hasn't been a. Um, do you call it the interior minister in, in, in Irish politics? In, in British politics, I'd say a home secretary, but there hasn't been a French interior minister right. who has control, had the police really under control since the, the 1990s, to my mind. Right. And so the police are, it's not that they're leading leading things, but they on the 30th of June, there was a joint statement by two of the police unions, which made it very clear to the government that they, you know, that they would, it was almost it was, it was like two steps away from 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 disobedience by the police uh -huh. wow and that's because you have a highly centralized police system okay which is again the state the government and the police you know the, the you don't have a kind of decentralization of the, of the policing system so that everything goes up to the uh the minister of the interior and if the minister of the interior is not you know not really taking the police by the scruff of the neck and keeping them under control mm -hmm. then it, that's not to say that you know macron has lost control of all the police i know he talked about two unions that that control about 50 percent of the of the membership french police are very highly unionized 90 percent of french police are members of a trade union oh wow but there is um, well uh, but in most societies you know in most states the, the police don't vote for the left <laughs> they really? tend to vote for the right or the far right or statistically speaking i mean you know um i mean you know i'm waiting in perhaps perhaps the the british police are woke seems unlikely uh but <laughs> i think um, ours are a bit woke to be honest <laughs> i love the guards uh anyway the guards as they used to say in dublin there's the guards anyway to go back to stage no there's this there's also but of course, if the state is, has lost control of the police and the police are the people out there shooting young lads because they're joyriding, mm -hmm. um, and they've been given, this is the other factor, in 2017, it wasn't actually Macron, it was his predecessor under Francois Hollande, they passed the law, and this was in response to a number of, number of events where police have been victims of, of violence or uh, uh, or there had been terrorist acts. It, it's a, a law on what's called the refus d'obtempore. And that means, it's very difficult to translate that, but it's the idea of refusal to comply with a police order. Okay. And this lad, Nael, was killed as a, within, that, within that context. He was shot within that context that he'd refused to comply with the police order. And that mm -hmm. at least was the, the, pr the, the pretext offered by the police. Now, when we look at the footage, it's actually quite difficult to tell whether he has refused or whether he has he's actually trying to and then you know there are various versions of the the story of what happened on that fateful day with that you know the yellow mercedes um but since that law passed uh, and the point of this law being that under under uh, it, it it allows the police if they feel that their lives are in danger the police uh, can shoot on sight right and so the refus d'octempore kind of becomes a shorthand for refusal to now there have been thousands of cases thousands upon thousands of cases reported of uh people who've been stopped by the police refusing to cooperate there you are there's another way of translating it right. um but the number of and and you know thousands of people are not being shot by the police but the number of people who have been shot and killed not just mm. injured but shot and killed um over the last since the, the legislation passed uh has uh has gone up exponentially 
And so it's also seen as being, and this is one of the reasons that Mélenchon comes out with a line like the police kill, or the police can kill or will kill, um, is that there is this sense that the police have been given, have been handed, uh, not quite a blank check, but certainly have been given the, the, the right to shoot on sight. Right. And of course, part of the problem is that they're armed. I mean, I don't know what the situation is in Ireland these days, but our police aren't armed. <laughs> no, they've got uh, arms and in, stuff like that. Here in, I mean, we have, there are armed units. I'm sure, you know, in, in certain situations, armed units are required. But in France, all police, uh, even, um, even transport police, um, are, um, are armed. Yeah, here they're not. Here they're not. It's like it's like Dublin, for example, has got so dangerous. Like it's so dangerous now, which is crazy. Right. Like there was a guy stabbed on the on Grafton Street, I think, two days ago, and there was oh. American. To yeah, yeah, yeah. A guy. Um, he was actually Algerian. The guy who stabbed the guy, he came here, I think, in November, and then a few weeks ago there was like an American tourist attacked, and then there was like it's it's daily now. So there's kind of a there's a kind of need to have more police force out on the streets in Dublin because you could walk yeah. around Dublin and you're like you won't see a, a policeman, which in this day and age you know I don't think you can really get away with it. So yeah, well, yeah, no, well, I mean, it's the 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 police are much more uh, visible in France than they are in Britain. Yeah. Example, you know, okay, so where I live, there's a police station around the corner. So I see them quite a lot, but only because there's a police station. <laughs> right, station. Not, right. Not because they're around my house regularly or <laughs> like that. But, um, but yes, I mean, day to day violence, heavens, you know, I'm talking to you from Nottingham, where, of course, not so very long ago, yes. two of students were, were stabbed to death. And, uh, well, and, and a third, well, three people together um, were, were murdered. So, yes, I mean, the, these, these things happen and, and there is, there is violence, but um, where was I going with that? The um, so yeah, the police, the French police have this, uh, uh, but of course the reaction, the reaction also to go back to the the French police unions is that they feel that every time that because this isn't the only case, Niall, there was during the riots that followed Niall's death, there was uh, there's a chap whose name escapes me, but in Marseille was. Um, shot with one of these uh these sort of kind of the equivalent of a rubber bullet once upon a time we talked about rubber bullets they're actually a kind of uh uh it's almost like you know a, a rubber ball and and he died as a consequence and oh. um, and the police uh as a co as a consequence of that actually the police who were responsible for that had been been taken into custody custody and uh and charged and that's that's created that created a massive not so much a strike by the police in mm. in Marseille and other in, in other places but they all claimed that they were on sick leave oh, and basically at one point marseille had very few police patrolling the streets so there's this kind of so there's this kind of counter and of course le pen the reason i introduced that idea is le pen it, it, it has always argued uh, or certainly has adopted over the last few years the idea that when she becomes president, she will introduce legislation um, whereby there will be an automatic presumption of innocence of uh, police officers who um, uh, who shoot uh, perpetrators who fail to comply, and uh, they would not be taken into custody. That's not to say they wouldn't eventually be charged, right. but actually they would be well. In many cases, this already exists. It has to be said that the the police system for investigating um, the commission that looks into uh, miscar not miscarriage of justice, um, police uh, conduct mm. um, in in France is has very few teeth, uh, and in many cases, the officers responsible for the death uh, the death of um, their victims are not thoroughly investigated the the right. institution is not independent it's part of the um of, of of the police force so it's very difficult to and so there's again there's a sense of injustice what about the guy who um who killed Niall? Uh, he's what still in custody yeah he's still in custody and of course you you probably know the the story about the uh there was a, a just a, a go fund me or a just fund me thing set up of what the yeah. French Kenyot and it went past a million euros in no time at all. Wow. Um, I mean, you know, it was to to help support his family, but it was set up by a far right wing activist. 
um, with a very clear uh, kind of and. Uh, but a lot of the comments as well, because of course people, when they make a comment, can uh, make a payment, can make a comment. And when you analyze the comments my people were make, making, it's very clear that a lot of people's contribution had nothing to do with, um, had something to do with supporting the family, but you know, it was also very much to do with clearing the scum off the streets, quote, quote you know, uh, in quotation marks. So that idea of, and of course, there's also this idea that because Nile is of uh, a certain ethnic, has a certain ethnic background, that, that it, again, it's underlining the idea of the irreconcilable differences between France and some of its um, uh, migrant populations. Yeah. And of course, that is then extended into Islam because his, his parents were uh, from here or from there or grandparents or great grandparents. Therefore, you know, we get into a religious uh, thing as well about uh, about Islam, which, as far as we know, you know, Niall didn't go to the mosque. There doesn't seem to be much evidence that that he was particularly religious, but it all gets you know wound up, um, sort of sort of bundled up into the same. Isn't that really thing? kind of quite an issue within France and and Europe? Because Europe has kind of become more secular than ever. Like I mean, I mean Ireland was so was very Catholic. Catholic. When I was growing up, you know, people go to mass. And, you know, like, whereas now, like, if you went to mass, there's like it's it's you know the numbers are so small. But it, I think... it isn't it, it isn't it isn't actually Paul. One of the things that really surprised me in so after twenty in twenty twelve, Francois Hollande's elected socialist mm. uh, president, and one of the things that he promises is the legalization of same sex marriage and the legalization of adoption for um, gay couples. Is it not legal in France, no? It wasn't until then, no. But okay, also okay. legalization of um, of surrogacy. Okay. Which is essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. That provokes, the reason I tell this story is that that provoked a massive uh, demonstration, a sort of counter demonstration by an outfit that called themselves, because it was in, Fran in France, same-sex marriage is known as marriage marriage for all marriage pour tous okay marriage for everybody and that was there was a counter demonstration big uh manif uh a manif pour tous which is you know a demonstration for all and it's a kind of counter demonstration that says you know marriage is basically against same-sex marriage against the possibility of adoption or even uh surrogacy for, for for gay couples all of that kind of stuff and that becomes politicized it's not you know it's not innocent mm -hmm. and it becomes politicized it, it grows into a movement and that movement backs uh not Le Pen she kind of keeps it a, a little bit at arm's length oddly enough but the 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 mainstream right-wing candidate in 2017 Francois Fillon uh makes a big song and dance about him being about his he, him being conservative it's not really a word the french use very much and also get to each and there's increasingly even amongst people who would um not see themselves as being outwardly catholic but not particularly going to mass or you know people like eric zamor who's not even catholic eric zamor right. is jewish but this this idea of France as being a Catholic, a country of Catholic origin. Some of the candidates at the last presidential election, uh, or even perhaps not the candidates, but candidates to be candidates, and some of them who've come, who've come out of it, have talked about the idea of putting into the constitution the phrase that France is a country of Judeo uh, Christian origin. Okay. Now that that is the language of the far right that's the kind of stuff that we get out of the great replacement theory you know the idea of um the idea of a western european or european civilization that is based on the values of the valeur judeo chrétien judeo judeo christian values we always have to keep the judeo bit in there because of the old testament I'm not really convinced about the degree to which they really believe in the judeo bit but anyway the so it's basically saying and of course at that at that point you're what you're saying is so that's you know there isn't we're not neutral anymore and that's been growing in france that kind of sense of 
Um, I mean, fundam- that's that's fundamentally, you know, sort of backing up a, a kind of supremacist case, and mm-hmm. that's um, I, and it's just something you hear from people who you who you might previously have thought were really quite sensible. Uh, and so there's so I understand what you're saying about mm-hmm. maybe a, a dechristianization of Ireland. Good heavens, but um, while it, that might be true in some places that there's a kind of secularization. Mm-hmm. In France, secularism is being used, certainly by Le Pen, it's being instrumentalized as um, as a shorthand for uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Islamic discourse. When, I mean, when she became leader of the, what was then the Front National, Le Pen, she she tried to sort of ditch the kind of the anti-Islamic discourse of her father um, by actually appropriating the language of the Republic, the secular Republic, uh, laïcité, secularism, Mm -hmm. and basically then using that as a way of um, demonizing um, Islam, demonizing particularly um, the physical manifestations of Islam, headscarf, uh dressing differently not just not just muslim women but muslim men as well mm-hmm. the idea and then of course what you say you know you say that these 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 people in inverted commas do not respect secularism the secularism of the republic therefore they are not compatible with the secular republic of course the subtext is they are muslim they are not compatible with with france Mm-hmm. Or Islam is not the values of Islam are not compatible with French values. So all of this is playing into uh, into the uh, the setup. And the problem for someone like Macron uh, is that he kind of goes along with this, and he's he's in something of a of a, of a double bind because he's trying to to steer a, a middle a middle way with all of this, and it's not particularly working. I don't think yeah yeah do you do you think that um issues to do with we'll say religion are a big big problem with within france because i don't think i don't think it it helps um i think it i actually think it helps kind of people like le pen for example like if if you would say for example in denmark where where the quran was burned yeah and then the embassy in syria is burnt down i mean if you burnt a bible no one would really nothing no yeah. one would care but there wouldn't be that you know same kind of thing that 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 almost like people like Le Pen can kind of use that and go well look at this and look at you know what I mean there's there's certain cases that you could kind of look to and use it as an advantage yeah I know absolutely I mean the the idea of the you know um someone like Le Pen or Zamora would see um would see what's happening in there was this instance in Sweden as well, isn't there? Of the, yes. the, the Quran as well, the yes. yeah. and uh, you know that whole they would see the 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 response that that provokes in the Islamic world as being well, you know, it just shows you how incompatible they are, and there are people. Um, I mean, there are co-curlingly far-right wing organizations in france that are probably only two steps away from from that sort of act the 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 and of course one of the reasons that france that charlie abdul was uh, was targeted back in in 2015 is because of the the publication of the images of uh, of the prophet muhammad mm-hmm. um in other countries you know things like in britain for example private eye has always avoided that sort of thing because it's understood at least that, uh, whether you whether you agree with that or not it's understood the you know the the the, the provocation that that, it, that that is seeing seen as being mm-hmm. um do you think that's caused of kind of a rift in france if you know what i mean as opposed to that people can go they, they look at that and that that's why they kind of might be turning more towards the right than the left I think that there's, I think there's a, a sense that the, the the left has been a bit soft, mm-hmm. and I think that that's you know that's not unusual. Um, you know, the idea of of allowing the allowing certain forms of Islam to install themselves in in certain areas of France, the idea that there that there are 
certain um, quartiers, certain districts of cities that have become no-go zones. It's not true, but it's there is that you know it's it's very easy to stoke that kind of that that kind of animosity. I mean, there's actually a very interesting. Uh, it's a co- um, I was going to say commune. That that doesn't mean the same thing in English. But there's a, a town, a, a small city actually, to the west of Paris called Tap, which has a very very high um, migrant population proportion of, of migrant population, but not it's not majority, mm-hmm. um, but very very high uh, number of of Muslims practicing or cultural Muslims. But the mayor is also of. Uh, his parents or his grandparents are of, of, of Arab origin. And it's a very interesting to look at how he's managing that, that situation. There's this kind of, it's called tap, this place. And everybody says, well, you just look at tap. You can't, you know, um, you know, to, to listen to some people, you think that, that white women, uh, not wearing a veil are getting stoned kind of thing. And it's, it's not like that, but it is kind of being used as an example. And it certainly caused a deep division within. Uh, within French society and, and the failures of, this is why Macron, uh, his in, his interior minister, Gerard Darmanin, tries to play the hard game because he, he is always, he comes, he came to Macron from, from the right. He's a former supporter of Sarkozy. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the reasons he was, he's appointed is he's, he's seen as being at least rhetorically, uh, tough on, on, uh, radical Islam, uh, and he's able to stand up to uh, Le Pen. He accuses her of actually being soft on oh. on fundamentalism. Yeah, there was a debate in 2021 where they they went head to head, Le Pen and Darmanin. It was it was quite absurd, actually. His <laughs> I mean his his performance was just bonkers. Yeah. Um, but um, is he a bad politician? I don't mean the sense in no, a bad person. Well, but some just... people think that he'll be the presidential candidate in 2027. Really? Because, well, Macron can't stand for a third term. The The French constitution only allows you to stand for two consecutive terms of office. He could come back uh... in 2032, but he can't be. And this is one of his problems, actually, is the now that they've they've changed the system so it's only five years and you can't be re-elected a third time. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of sense of okay, you've been elected for the for your second term, but already everybody who who claims to support you is thinking about so how do I you know I'm manoeuvring to be candidate in 2027. So he's no Darmanin is for some people. Some people see him certainly Nicolas Sarkozy uh, sees Darmanin as being uh, a potential candidate in 2027, right. um, and that will be on the basis in terms of domestic policy. It'll be on the basis of him having been the interior minister who dealt with the the riots of June, July 2023, mm-hmm. who has brought the police back under control if he does that, who's been, you know, a hardliner, but isn't on the far right. So that that would be his shtick, would be I'm tough on tough on crime, mm-hmm. but I'm not a fascist. Right. <laughs> but so that would you know that, that's that's the well that would if if I were a French voter, so I'm yeah. sort of centre left. If it came to a contest between in the second round of voting, Le Pen and Darmanin, I would probably vote for him on the grounds that he's not the fascist. Or he's you reckon, not you, reckon, you know, she's, he's not, she's a fascist. And a lot of people would be stuck in that. Well, a lot of people, a lot of left wing voters this time around were stuck in that. They did they had what what happened in 2022? Mélenchon is eliminated, just. Mm. Um, so what have we got? We've got Macron. If I'm a if I'm a center left voter, I probably wouldn't have voted for him in the first round in 2022. Mm-hmm. But in the second round, I've got a choice between him and Le Pen. <laughs> Okay, well, I vote for the neoliberal or I vote for the far right. Ooh, that's that's a tricky that's a tricky call. Do you think it's it's actually the riots have changed certain? No, obviously, not. You're not going to change someone as a whole, but you've cha- you, you they've changed people's voting. What they may have a voting pattern because I talked to some of my friends who live in France who are French, and they would be very left wing. You know, not saying far left, but you know they'd be left wing. Yeah. And they said that they would probably vote for Le Pen, which is surprisingly because they were very like pro Macron, we'd say during the last election. 
but they they have kind of seen it as like well what's the worst that could happen if you know what i mean there's that kind well, of thing I, g- I gave you the example earlier of, of a couple of friends of mine who i was chatting with yes, in April, yes. even before the uh because they see um you see in terms of things like the pension reform if we, it's not not necessarily the rise but the pension reform that, that that's just been carried out they see macron as being some kind of neoliberal mm-hmm. whereas le pen is promising that if you started working at the age of you know so long as you've you've made 43 years of pension contributions you can retire at the age of 60. oh she, she's making promises that actually she's writing checks she can't actually cash yeah exactly okay, in real terms that's never going to happen but but that's what she that's what she claims so you can you can understand a lot and then you know you throw in all the other things these two friends of mine are both teachers in difficult areas uh in france experienced teachers it's very often actually in france because of the way the system works a lot of the schools in the in the volume are actually staffed by young and inexperienced teachers because you don't it's not like well in the british system a school recruits its own teachers okay mm-hmm. if i need a french teacher i make an ad, i advert i advertise for a french teacher candidates apply and i appoint who i want in france it's not done that way the ministry of education has its national pool of teachers and it sends them to wherever all oh, right so what tends to happen is because you have because you have very high turnover of teachers in difficult areas you tend to send young people to the areas where um nobody else wants to go right it doesn't happen at, i mean there comes a point in your career where you you get points it's a point system in france okay three chinese <laughs> and what have you and a certain number of points gets you to the point gets you to the point haha where you can say actually i don't want to teach here anymore i want to teach in Brittany, or i want to teach somewhere nice and that's the point at which you can be moved somewhere else but if you're a young teacher um my my wife her in her previous uh life she was married and she wasn't married sorry she her partner was a teacher and because he was a young teacher at the time he would only find out where he was actually going to be working weeks before the term started and they would then have to move like that to be close to to where he was working because he didn't have uh he hadn't been given you know the level of status of making you know a permanent job in, in place he had a job for life because you're a civil servant mm-hmm. and trials, if you're in the civil service, it's a job for life but you don't early in your career know where you're going to be okay mm-hmm. so let's go back and say these so these two these two young uh friends of mine young no they're my age so they're not young at all friends of <laughs> um hey, you look you look young don't worry thank you very much you're very kind um the um so these friends of mine both uh one working with uh, special needs uh and the other an experienced teacher of uh, economics in uh a town where in june they had riots at the lycee i think they they attacked the lycee as well um but back in april they were saying why wouldn't you vote for le pen you can understand why people would vote for le pen and one of them saying what's the worst that could happen so yeah you know there's kind of a uh not just a, 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 a to some extent a sort of sort of sense of apathy but also the sense that you know the, the these were traditional socialist voters who are looking at um the neoliberal macron or you know whoever comes after macron versus the somebody who stands up who appears at least outwardly to stand up for the the central state and that's mm-hmm. the you know that's always a bit of a debate in france as well the role of the you know the state versus decentral well not decentralization but picking that apart because that's also part of what's um concerning the french is the the uh the french social model being dismantled right is it to do with is it to do with, we'll say like identity too is there a certain amount of that because well cause... there is a certain amount of that i mean it's all tied up in the yeah again the idea if we go back to what i was saying earlier about the you know some politicians suggesting that we should put france is a a country of judo judeo christian origin that's mm. very clearly expressing that idea of identity politics you know the politics of uh America. It's very but American. also thing, isn't it? yeah but also i think that there is well i think there's also a, a realization I was reading quite an interesting article about this 
Uh, and it kind of chimes in with something that somebody said to me about American politics is that actually the majority of older uh, men and women uh, in ethnic, from ethnic minorities are not progressive in their politics. Right. And there was quite a lot. It's very interesting in the coverage of the riots this time round. The number of uh, times that journalists went out to, of course, you know, that they're deliberately publishing what they want to publish, mm -hmm. uh, talking to the parents of the the rioters. Maybe that perhaps they were the parents, perhaps they weren't. But of course, the the quotations that they love to repeat are the ones where you have the the older generation saying, "I tell you what, send them back to Algeria for the summer." then they'll know what it is to suffer. You know, that idea wow. of, so people of Algerian origin, either first gen, first or second generation migrants saying, you know, these young kids, they should go and live in Algeria for a bit or Tunisia or go back to the old country. Right. You go back to the old country and see what it's all about. And there, this is a, this is a potential electorate. Although I said earlier, and that a lot of studies have been made about how the left is, or the far left, the, uh, Mélenchon company are kind of, getting the vote there um you know Mel Shaw himself is is not a liberal he's not he's not a liberal by any means but he's not you know he's in a sense he's he's quite a dictatorial figure as well right. you know it's 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 top down and so there's kind of an authoritarianism about him uh that maybe appeals to those generations but they could flip you know one of the things we know is that it doesn't take it's not very far to go from being on what appears to be one end of the spectrum to the other it's not it's not as and the reason i make the analogy with america is again i was talking with a, a specialist in in american policy said we make a very you know you make a very big mistake when you imagine that african americans are progressive yeah you know, african yeah. african americans who goes to church most in in you know in in, in america african americans it's not strictly true but it depends but you know that the, the, these are actually profoundly conservative people mm -hmm. and the same is true of a certain generation so well most muslim idea, countries are conservative like yeah and and so, so like there's that. this there's there's a very strong sense of of she wouldn't actually le pen wouldn't necessarily need to one of the things that she that that, that, that she says is i'm not against i'm not against islam i'm against radicalist uh, islamism mm -hmm. i'm against fundamentalism um she lets other people say the you know the is is Islam is incompatible with French values. She never says that. Well, not directly. I mean, she does sort of hint at it. Mm -hmm. Um, because she, I think she knows that yes, there is a kind of identitarian element to this, but also that, that there are, there are votes to be, to be got there. So it's, but, but identitarian politics is there. But I have to say that oh, to go back to these two friends of mine, mm -hmm. uh, that I was talking about, um, one of them wasn't white okay and she was the one actually who expressed the view what's the worst that can happen hmm. that's interesting so that's you know that's the kind of, and for in a sense she, she kind of embodies this this sense of exasperation yeah yeah but i think it but i i mean the conversation then went on to yes but the, the, isn't there a risk you know the french use the use the idea of the electroshock and you would and of course in French politics, you would if you'd elected Le Pen in 2027, you know you've got five years of Le Pen. Okay. Yeah. And so perhaps they think, perhaps there's this belief that because it would be time bound, okay, we just have to put up with it for five years and then we get rid of them as we say, wasn't that awful? Well, you prefer not to go through that. Yeah. You might prefer not to go through that. So I yeah. think, that, you know, the, the notion of the electroshock is a little bit concerning. It's a bit like, you know, here in Britain, having uh, oh, you know, Boris Johnson making PM. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> um, or you know, Rishi or or Liz. Um, yeah, so, uh, it's, it's like politicians are kind of like I've had politicians on the podcast, and you would give them figures of like, like Aaron, for example, is it's in it's in a quite a strange area because our our actual population has grown sixty percent since like the nineties. Like if you look at like England's population or the UK's population's grown fifteen percent, ours grown sixty sixty percent, and in the last six years, it's grown eight percent, not including 
we'll say the hundred thousand Ukrainians and asylum seekers, you could put another two percent. So, like, it's growing so fast that it's, and we have a housing crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's there's like you put the questions out to these people, and you're like, okay, well, we can't keep, we can't keep bringing loads of people in. We actually don't have room for everyone. But it's always met with like, oh no, we can. And you're like, <laughs> you know, it, eventually you're gonna, the people are gonna start turning towards the right because of failings of the government to not yeah. go, okay, there yeah. is issues and stuff like that. And I think it's happened in, in obviously in England or in, in, in the UK. Like, I mean, the Tories have been in power for what, how many, 15 years? And they've been on about stop Actually. the boats for about, yeah. you know, like it's the same kind of issues, just not yeah, listening yeah. to the people. So yeah. uh, what what's quite interesting to me is that uh, the difference between France and Britain, for example, mm. um, my my knowledge of Irish politics kind of stops in about 1992. So obviously I'm, I'm sort of way out of it. But, but you have, I mean, in France, the, the growth of of the far, the far right, <clears throat> the success of Le Pen is really to do with the failure of the conventional right. That's the French example. The in Britain, slightly different. What you have is, you know, let, let's not let's not uh, mince our words. We have a far right government. Would you say they're far right? Yeah. Oh yes. Good look. Good really? look. Yeah. 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 Oh. Anybody who's got Suella Braverman as their interior minister is a far right government. <laughs> I mean, it's you know there there are a, we've been the, the Conservative Party has been drifting that way since Thatcher. And there have been some social conservatives who tried to pull it back. Actually, with in in you know in the modern Conservative Party, ironically, uh, Johnson was was relatively speaking a social conservative, but Sunak is no social is not a social conservative, and Braverman is not a social conservative. And to my mind, my my experience of living here at the moment is that is my sense of it is that although they they use the terms right and even have the temerity to claim that they are centre right, I I don't feel that that's that that's where we are. It's so what you've had is a drift within a party, whereas in France it was it's been the the withering away of the conventional Republican oh, okay. right that has created the space for the for the far right. I'd be interested to to. You know, this is this is another debate for for people who are more expert than me. Mm. What what happened in Ireland? Is it the fate? Would it be would it be somebody within Fianna Fáil? Because I always thought of you know Fianna Fáil as being more of the right and Fianna Fáil as being more of the, the same. Or, you know the, who knows? Same. Yeah, well, it's basically you know it's really Dublin, South Dublin versus North Dublin, or mm. uh, or whatever you know. However you wanted to, to define it, but would it be where does that where does that far right come from? Is it going to be outside? It'll definitely be outside. It'll definitely be. Outside. You have three parties who are kind of the same, really. You know what I mean? Like, like, like the failings of 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 those parties are just like just massive. Like, like the fact that we have a housing crisis is actually yeah. just. I mean, it's bad. It is bad. Like, I mean, you couldn't. Like, if you want to move to Dublin, it's just like there's nowhere to stay. No, I I I follow a couple of. Um, uh, I was going to say Irish academics. One's um, working at, at Cork, and the other is Irish, but working here in uh, Northumbria. But mm -hmm. they very often post up stuff on Twitter where you know you have these huge queues of people waiting to to look at one house kind of thing. And I mean, I know it was it was difficult getting accommodation in Ireland in, in Dublin in nineteen ninety. It was expensive. It wasn't difficult in nineteen ninety two. But uh, when I look at the and then see what the conditions are, you sort of think. Ye gods. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it, it's crazy. And it kind of hasn't really, it hasn't helped matters with the, the kind of influx of kind of people coming into the country of, we'll say that it's kind of created this weird thing of like, if you come into a country, for example, with asylum, because it's such a big issue at the moment that you get put up in a place and people are like, well, I don't have a place. Now, whether it's, they get put up in a good place or a blab yeah. place, that's kind of irrelevant in people's minds because they're looking at, well, our homeless has gone up like we've 13,000 homeless people, which is strange in Ireland. Like when I grew up as a kid, I never saw a homeless person. Like I never, yeah. I just never saw it. No. So I think it's only forcing people to the right. Like the government has, is slowly creating a far right in Ireland where we never really had one. We had like, you know, 
there's always been like aspects of little things but you can see it now well there was a kind of i i there was always a strong sense of irish identity that drove yeah politics, but it wasn't necessarily based on hatred of the other but no like, but i think irish people are starting to feel um there's a certain kind of thing with to say like we we're talking about identity in france of when you look yeah. at census stuff like that and our, our we would say ethnic irish for example has gone from we say 90 percent now to nearly 70 something percent so there's like a there's a certain like that and i think that's it's drifting people towards the more right and i think that's the thing in europe that's kind of drifting people to more the right whereas like, yeah. like france could look at their population and go hey you know ours is slowly falling and stuff like that so i think it's it's a it's a europeish european issue as as, as yeah a, i think so i think so and of course the you know migration flows are not going to stop yeah yeah I mean, and one the, I think the, the problem the, is yeah and the problem is we can't have a conversation about it you can't actually have a conversation without someone going you're far right or you're far no whatever aisle you're talking about you're far right or far left and so like we should be able to have a conversation about it yeah. without you know well i mean one of the one of the big concerns one of the reasons that europe is looking so very closely what's happening in niger with the yeah. uh, the coup d'etat there is that you know there's all of the migration is caused by instability mm -hmm. Now, the, the historian within me will tell you that you can't stop migration. It's historical. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it happened through for a whole time. bunch of reasons. Yeah, and I don't need to tell the Irish mm. about migration. You know, I'm not going to you know, tell you your own history. Yeah, <laughs> all kinds of reasons, yeah. whether that's economic, whether it's to do with famine, whether it's to do with war, whatever the reason, mm -hmm. people move. Mm -hmm. So if there is instability, if there is famine, if there is, you know, wherever it is in the world, and this is where to my mind at least the british government made a big make a big mistake by cutting aid you know wherever it is that's going to create movement and the question is where does that movement stop mm. how do you stop it happening you stop it happening by giving people a reason to move in the first place you know so that's you and you have to you're quite right there has to be a joined up intelligent discussion of how do we help people stay where they are yeah Let's yeah. let's express it that way rather than saying let's stop migration. Yeah, let's, let's you can't express stop it as an idea. Of, let's help people s live, thrive in the places where they are. That would be, you know, a much more useful way of thinking about it. So, 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 so in terms of we'll say like France has a has a large um, population of Al Algerians. What is the economic uh what's sorry what's the economy like in algeria because there seems to be a lot of people moving in from algeria now well the you see one of the things about one of the things the far right loves about algeria is that it's a basket case <laughs> it is i mean it's a society society that functions right but um you know i mean you even get uh far right politicians and supporter of eric zamour who um, posted up on on twitter i had the misfortune to follow these people because i studied them um but he he got some um he'd been out to the uh been out to algeria and found a chap living you know of a certain age living out in a village in the middle of nowhere in algeria brought him over to france and got this bloke to say in a meeting that when you know we can't i, I can't wait for the french to uh, to come back and take control of things because it's such a mess and of course that feeds the because the far right is is nourished by the idea of of you know colonialism and the civilizing mission and if only we'd stayed in algeria we could have you know we wouldn't have had this problem because algeria would have been happy algerians would have st stayed at home uh they yeah. would have flourished under french rule but we gave them their independence and look what happened you know because that's the discourse isn't it amongst mm -hmm. you know imperialists uh colonizers it was so much better when we were there that's always the that's always the story now i'm not going to i'm not going to counter that in the sense of saying algeria is 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 a wonderful state because we know that uh that's not the case but the other problem for algeria is that uh, over the last few years, it's suffered massively from drought. Right. Uh, and so, I mean, we expect that in the Sahara, but northern Algeria is uh, is a Mediterranean country, okay, has mm. a Mediterranean climate, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing. But there's, okay, so you've had 
yes, mismanagement, political. Uh, there was a civil war there, yeah, the nineteen nineties between the between the the regime and uh, the uh, Islamic fundamentalists, the the fils, the fondis, uh, the um, Islamic the the salut, yes, the, the Islamic Salvation Front, um, and of course there's still that that threat uh, to to Algeria of of fundamentalism of uh, you know al uh, terrorism by al qaeda the the infiltration of uh, et cetera et cetera about algerian society and that creates that creates instability and but also of course um quite a high birth rate and so that places pressure on an infrastructure that that that, that can't cope or mm. seems to be unable to cope and therefore uh migration but in is that what is interesting is that although there is a migratory flow out of Algeria towards France, actually, as you yourself have mentioned, you also see it now to countries where Algerians never went before, because there was kind of the language thing that if you were an educated uh, Algerian or even educated, whatever that means, you had some French or you had family in France because of the historical links, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, that's happening less because French was seen, is seen as the language of the former colonizer. We learn English because that's the language of business. And then we move to Ireland, Canada, if you're a skilled worker, because the Canadians actually have very strict quotas mm -hmm. uh, migration. Also, as I say, great, uh, great Britain. I mentioned the student of mine who's in the first year at the moment, Hannah, her, um, her grandfather originally went to France, but then, uh migrated to to england because of um well for various reasons but one of them was the uh, sort of hostility towards uh towards his family that he felt in, in the forms right so i'll just ask you I, geez, I, I, sorry about the time i don't that's know all right you know well i'm the one who's giving it that i'm, I'm enjoying i'm enjoying a good conversation <laughs> um do you think um do you think Le Pen will get in again i know it's hard to say because it's what three years Four years away, three years, away, four years away. Like, do you think she will get in? Because obviously, I think by that stage, um, we, we've talked about migration. It's going it to very much depend on who her opponent is in the second round, right? Because, or, or I should say, do you think it will be more right wing government? It's probably a better question than Le Pen. Again, I, I think the answer remains the same. It mm. will depend on who gets through to contest the election against her. Now, if it were, it can't be Macron. Mm -hmm. If it's a Macroniste, somebody who is kind of identified as Macron's successor, and there who, are a number who would, who of, would that be? Who would that? Well, be? there are a number of, of there are a number of people sort of jockeying for that position. Mm. Uh, I mentioned Gerard Darmanin being mentioned. Um, another would be the former prime minister, Edouard Philippe, who comes, who came to Macron from the French right. He was uh, actually an advisor, very politically very close to the former French prime minister, Alain Juppé, who's seen as being, uh, Philippe is seen as being much more of a kind of center right. Uh, the French use the word rassembleur, the idea of somebody who can bring people together, not a unifier or a uniter, but somebody who gathers people together. Uh -huh. That's the best way I can translate that. So he might be seen as a, as a rassembleur. Uh, but if it's Mélenchon, the big, so whether, whoever it is who's her opponent, the question is, can that person bring together enough electors to to beat her what is going to be what what kind of numbers would they need to beat her she got 41 percent last time now in order to get elected in the second round obviously you've got to get 50 percent plus one vote yes and that's how it works only two candidates so you know is she capable of getting that 50 percent plus one or is there someone who in a second round would gather together enough voters of the center and the left mm -hmm. are left is there a candidate let's say for the center who would attract voters of the left or would they all stay at home or is there a left-wing candidate who would attract voters of the center 
that's going to be and will they care because the other thing we talk about in french politics is the collapse of the of the republican bloc the idea that to use the spanish expression no pasaran that the okay we don't like the right or we don't like the left but we don't want the far right and in 20, yeah. you know in 2002 when her father got through to the second round jean marie le pen jacques chirac was massively re-elected 80 percent of the vote basically le pen got oh. no more votes in the second round oh. than he and the other far right wing candidate had got in the first round because there was a massive sense of republican solidarity we don't like jacques chirac mm -hmm. but when the left were eliminated there is a massive the, the turnout is higher and a massive uh, vote of solidarity for jacques chirac mm -hmm. Not my cup of tea as a left wing voter if I'm a French left wing voter, but my God, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to let the other bloke get in. Right, right. And that was a statement. Now, of course, unfortunately, it was it was a statement, but also it kind of it meant that Jacques Chirac's re-election wasn't was kind of seen as being unauthentic that he mm -hmm. won because he wasn't the fascist. So you the know, lesser of two the evils kind of thing. It's not the other bloke. Yeah, absolutely. Right whereas and in 20 you know 2017 macron gets a certain amount of that because macron is an unknown quantity he looks like he comes from the center you know he emerges as an advisor to Hollande, so he kind of talks to the the moderate left he appeals to the moderate right also of course the moderate rights candidate turns out to be a crook so that vote kind of doesn't collapse actually he still gets 20 percent of the vote yeah. enough of his voters back Macron in the first round for Macron to be the person who goes through. And then we do see, on the whole, a pretty solid vote for him. I mean, she gets 33%. One of the, the, the prognoses was that she would get 40%. So when she only gets 33% of the vote, there's this kind of big whew, sigh I, of relief. I thought she might have won it. I thought she might have actually won it that, that, in that 2017. Way. Yeah. No, that was never on the cards. The real really? Was, yeah, the real fear that was that she would get higher than 40%. Right. Okay, anything under 40% was generally regarded as being the, um, the uh, a failure for her. And she, she, it's very interesting to, and we can go on for hours about this, but to look at the way she conducted herself between the first and second round in 2017, where she was everywhere. It was very frenetic. Okay. And in 2022, she said, right, I'm not making those mistakes again. I'll let Macron make the mistakes. I'll just sit back. I'll make a few local appearances. I'll do my thing. I'll turn up for the presidential debate, which was a bit, you know, tedious. He won it, but you know, and then we'll see what happens. And again, this time round, the view was that anything north of forty percent for her was good, and that's what she got, forty-one percent. And so, although it looks on paper like she got thumped, fifty-nine to forty-one, yeah. actually she did better than she did a point better than she needed to and um also uh then of course she's boosted by the national assembly elections where completely against all predictions she gets 89 seats i mean we were talking about oh. most commentators were, were looking at looking at the results of the of the various opinion polls we looked at the results of the first round of She'll probably get about 35, 40 seats, and she got 89. Wow. So there is clearly, you know, it's, it's almost as if the presidential election was forgotten. Right. Six weeks, because part of the problem was that it was there was there was a six week gap. In 2017, it was only four weeks. And uh, so this big gap, Macron is no longer, you know, the new guy, looks exciting, you know, he's. So we all go out, we go out and vote for Macron because we don't because we don't have not out of a sense of enthusiasm for Macron. Yes. Um, and that of course is what causes the problems over pensions reform, because there's a very strong sense amongst people who did vote for Macron, who are not 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 natural Macron voters, that mate, we voted for you, but we didn't vote for you because we like your policies. We voted for you because you're not her. Right. So and that's where a lot of the antagonism over the over pensions reform comes from. Is he viewed as right wing? Or, I don't think he's. He's, right -wing, he's, he's regarded now as being on the on the right. Really? Not, 
not far right. I, most people, most commentators see would say that he is, he is. I mean, his left wing has not completely disappeared, but but a lot of his left wing supporters actually were beaten in the election. Um, two of the key figures, one uh, Christian Castaner, who's the leader of the Macronist uh, deputies in the National Assembly, and the Speaker of the National Assembly lost their seats. Never happened before that the Speaker of the National right. Assembly has lost their seat in a in a general election. Um, but we've we've seen it from about 2019, 20 onwards, that there's been a real droitisation, uh, and we saw it in response to the riots. That although you know, his response to the video of Niall being shot is that it's, um, uh, you know, unbelievable and, and uh, un unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But actually, his, his, apart from that, of course, we then sent out 45,000 policemen to deal with the, with the riots, including uh, SWAT teams and, uh, uh, and anti-terrorist units. You know, wow. We've got people, we're, we're not just talking about gendarmes with a little pistol that they hit, we're talking mm -hmm. about Always with really big, uh, really big guns. Were they guys though that would be not actual like we'd say like they'd be like military guys? So that, would they be people outside of France almost that would come in or would they just no, be all not French? quite. But they are the they are the SWAT the equivalent of the SWAT team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're the they're the armed they're the they're the the sort of sniper heavy handed yeah. and the arm the, the the ones you see in the in the TV shows when there's a hostage situation. Uh, right, right. You know those those guys they're not just ordinary coppers who've got a gut who've been allowed to to carry a rifle they were i mean some of the the pictures while i was over there i was uh, i did quite a number of interviews for france 24 and also for a turkish tv station called trt it's quite interesting to you know i'm sort of like like at the moment i've got my little picture up here but on the main screen i'm looking at the footage uh -huh. that the turkish tv or even the french tv station are showing and they're showing these lads in their armored vehicles with you know with the big guns you know yeah. pointing you know just keeping keeping an eye on things but that carries its own risks because these people these policemen are not trained to deal with public order they're de trained to deal with <laughs> you know shooting people yeah um and that's what happened in marseille that four of them um out of their depth not not trained to uh to really deal with a public order uh situation uh shot first and asked questions afterwards and somebody died and there's a consequence mm -hmm. four of them i think are still in custody mm -hmm. so and that's that's what set off the the um you know everybody suddenly all the police in marseille suddenly being on sick leave um mm -hmm. no so to go back a stage macron is definitely seen is very much seen as being but also not just in terms of law and order i mean i think it's also He's seen as being on the right because of his his economic policies. You know, it's much more. He's seen as being the neoliberal, okay, yeah. uh, the neoliberal, but the liberal who's, you know, even one of the first things he did in 2017 was to uh, was to amend um, inheritance law, uh, uh, wealth tax. Sorry, not inheritance law, wealth tax, and that was seen as being a beneficial to the rich. Well, of course, the classic liberal says if we if we free up the wealthy to create wealth then that trickles down oh, here we go um, <laughs> and so that's kind of classic that's seen as being classic right-wing rhetoric so even if there's a little bit of left-wingism about him i would say that most people now in france if you went up to them and said hello emmanuel is emmanuel macron on the right or the left and say he's on the right really and certainly most of his cabinet are I mean, Elizabeth Bourne comes from the Socialist Party, so his prime minister is from the left. But most of the the big hitters in the cabinet originate from the the conventional French right. Yeah, uh, but, uh, can I ask like two more questions? Is that okay? Two more then. Okay. Where's the <laughs> capital? What's the capital of Bolivia? That's La Paz. <laughs> You're done now. Uh, <laughs> you were back, You said something earlier about the about the kind of left being seen as uh, soft. You know. Um, Do you, some some of them yeah so do you think with within government that that's kind of caused an issue not just in france but in everywhere that you've kind of it's like you're never left enough if you know what i mean like i'm i would view myself as more like a centrist kind of person probably center right but i think by people who are very left i would be seen as right wing you know what i mean that you're yeah. never left enough do you think that's kind of has that is there any issues like that within france I think that I think the problem for the left in France mm. 
it, it's more complicated than that in france the, the left collapsed okay you know, the left in 2012 you know we easily francois Hollande gets elected president mm -hmm. there's a massive as a consequence there's a massive left-wing majority elected to the national assembly for the first time almost ever the senate is on the left because of elections in 2011 mm -hmm. the french control all the regions and pretty much all the big cities wow you know it's it's a bit like the football chant five nil and you you know <laughs> and the left just complete somehow for some reason internal stupid a, a, a president really the guy francois Hollande, he's a guy who wants to be president but doesn't know what to do with it oh, okay and you've got to have a project and he doesn't really have one same-sex marriage is a great thing a great project it's not enough to hang the whole presidency on mm -hmm. so it kind of it and gradually he's kind of uh he, he campaigns as being a, a president normal an, an ordinary president just mediocre in the end and so the left begins to 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 splinter and it and it falls apart and you've got this far left figure Mélenchon who of course then rides into that space but the problem is that Mélenchon I suppose this is this is where your question of uh, being left enough. The problem for many left-wing voters with Mélenchon is that his Euroscepticism. And there are a lot of people in, in France on the, on the moderate left who are perfectly happy with the European project. Mélenchon sees Europe as having, he's an old Trotskyist, and he is very much like, he's, there are many things about Mélenchon that are very Corbynist. Corbynist. So it's a very socialist in a lot of aspects of him. Well, he's, I mean, Mélenchon is, you know, he comes from the Socialist Party. He starts mm -hmm. out as a Trotskyist as a young man. He's in the Socialist Party, but he's Eurosceptic. He leaves, he campaigns against the European Constitution in 2005. He leaves the Socialist Party in 2008, sets up his own little party. We all think that he's, you know, a kind of peripheral, uh, peripheral figure. And then in 2012, he gets 11% of the vote nearly 20% into in 2017 and he's kind of recasting this hard eurosceptic patriotic left hmm. uh, but that of course is alienating to quite a lot of more uh softer left uh, voters if you like um but he's the cuckoo in the nest as it were on, on the french left and he's taken over he's the dominant voice certainly the loudest voice anyway the, the mr shouty um on the left and and that's kind of squeezed out the more moderate uh center left in france so that's they also your first question is uh are you left enough who knows but the um it's 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 quite a uh being on the left in france is quite a challenge because i mean we're seeing it because the threat in france they're already talking about next year's european elections mm. and although they agreed a broad electoral alliance in 2022 in order to maximize their seats since then the the way that Mélenchon's party uh france unbowed la france insoumise has conducted itself that's led to splintering and so ahead of the european elections they're saying no no the the other parties saying no we don't want anything to do with all right all right so my last question for you <laughs> if that's cool uh how did you get into french um not politics but french history or what made you get into into it because obviously it's a vast vast uh, I, um... and also uh, if you were to tell somebody to to what's the most interesting part of french history if you were to read a book on it the most interesting part of french history i know there's many the revolution maybe. i don't know but like you know the bit I like most, if you like, is the interwar period. That's where I started. Okay. I um okay, to answer your first question, why France? I did well, I did French at A level. Mm -hmm. So the you know, the equivalent of your your leaving cert. <laughs> uh, um and um why did I like French in the first place? Just because my parents took me on holiday there. Really? Uh I did French and then I was really a, a historian. I went off to do my first degree at uh, University of London, but actually I specialised in East European history, hmm. went to a place called the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of London. And then I went to do a one-year master's at Oxford. And that's where I thought, I've done all of this East European stuff, I ought to just fo I ought to focus a bit more on my Western European history. And the guy they gave me as a supervisor was a, a man called Robert Gilday, who's one of the leading uh, English historians of France. 
or British historians of France. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to do a doctorate with Robert, and but I didn't want to do British history. I hadn't studied, I'd done East European history, but hadn't done languages. So the only thing I had was French, and he was, you know, this professor of French history. So I'll do something in French history with him, and that was it. Really, it was quite a, it's not a passion. Mm. In a sense, it was quite a pragmatic decision. Okay, I decided to do to do that, and um, I did my thesis with him on the women's movement in France in the twenties and thirties. Because uh, the reason I did that was that um, women didn't get the vote in France after the First World War; they had to wait until after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And so, I wanted to know. I wanted to work on on why, but also what did they do to organise themselves? You know, what was the? How did they respond to not getting the vote? You know, we had in Britain, you have the suffragettes, you have suffragism, you have, you know, political women everywhere. Where are the political women in France? And nothing had been written about them. So that was my, that's where I went in. And, um, and then, of course, in the 1990s, when I was, I, I had my first post was at Salford, uh, teaching European history, not just French history, but also I was in history and, and, and in the French department. And I had my year at University College Dublin, where I didn't, Actually, I, I did teach some French history uh, final year level. I had my own little module to do, but I taught uh, a module on British and uh, French feminism. But I actually, actually, they got me to do uh, Eastern Europe. Um, oh. so I taught a first year paper at UCD on, on Eastern European history. And then I got my job here at Nottingham in the French department, but being a historian. Oh, wow. well, the great thing for a historian of France, if you've got students who are modern language students, is that they can read French. <laughs> so you don't have to translate everything for them, and I've been I've been here ever since. Wow! So it was kind of accidental, uh, but also deliberate. And mostly now, what I do because you don't stay the same, you don't stay the same person. <laughs> um, so I've actually moved much more towards a later twentieth century perspective. I've written, but I, I really focus on political institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of anything from 1870 to the present day, but I suppose mostly focused on um, the late 20th century. Do you ever find out like new stuff that you never knew? Because obviously history is kind of- All been... the time, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Good Was, written, was there anything that was like super interesting that you were like, oh my God, that you totally were oh, like- Oh no! <laughs> Did I not know that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's nothing really lately that you've 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 you stumbled upon that you're like, whoa, shit, man, that's cool. Well, I think the stuff about the 1960s actually. I've gone back and because um, I teach a final year module about Charles de Gaulle in the 1960s in France, and um, a few years ago, a good friend and uh, not colleague of mine in the sense that he he didn't teach here at Nottingham, but he's at Reading, a chap called Andy Knapp, who's professor of French politics at Reading. Mm -hmm. He retired and he said, Paul, I've got this huge library of French books. Um, come and help yourself. So I did. And they're over there. Wow. And um and quite a lot of his stuff, because he he, you know, written huge, huge numbers of books. He had a load of really good material from the 60s and 70s, which are the 60s is quite well known, but it's the 70s that's a bit less well known. So I'm kind of really enjoying going back and looking at some of that stuff. And what I was telling you earlier about the, the Johnny Alliday concert, you know, where the kids uh, are kind of being stewarded on the way home and decide to chuck bricks at a policeman. Mm. You know, that's uh, you, you kind of have an image of the 1960s or of you know, French Johnny Halliday crowd as being pretty well behaved, and then you realise that no, they weren't, and it was it was violent, and it kind of helps you to remember when I was a kid growing up. I often say this to my students. You know, people talk about you know, things going on in Ukraine at the moment and all that. I said, well, I grew up with the Vietnam War on the news every night. Yeah, uh, and then of course in the seventies it was the Troubles, and then you know it was you know people talk about when French friends talk about oh this Islamic terrorism, say well you know Harrods um the, these things these things happened you know it's 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 our society is our societies plural are are given to moments of extraordinary violence yeah it's it's a constant thing it's just it's it a, it's sick it's kind of secular like it's a, like yeah. we always repeat the same humans seem to always just never learn by mistakes we just it's different iterations always no. 
Uh, no, but one of the biggest mistakes we we made was to think that uh, post-Soviet Russia would be our friend. But that's another debate for another time. That's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Paul, hey, man, thank you so much for doing this. I, no problem at all. I really, no sorry, sorry if I went too long. I'd said to you yeah, like an hour like that, but uh, very. I'm I'm all up for talking about history all the time. But uh, hey, thank you very much for doing this. I really appreciate it, and I really my pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. And you, Paul. Cheerio. Cheers. (laughs) Bye-bye.